Hi, everybody. I am very, very excited to be here at Helium DV, and that's not just the six cups of coffee that I've had today talking. Actually, I want to start out by talking about coffee. Everything usually goes a little better for me when I start with coffee, so I figured, why not today? Coffee is more than a beverage. This is probably a really obvious thing to say. There's this entire experience that's built around it. And there's a large number of companies around the world, big and small, that get it. For example, one of my favorite Seattle coffee companies, let's call them Starlux, has built this entire experience around coffee that people like me take for granted every day. When I walk into Starlux, I know exactly what I'm going to get, I know what I'm going to pay, and I can even pay with my smartphone. I could order in advance. I could have my coffee waiting for me when I get there, or I could download an app that keeps my entire coffee history right there and even rewards me for making the right choice, which, of course, is consuming more coffee. Now, I'm obviously a repeat Starlux customer. I'm a big fan of the brand, and it's not just because of the taste of their product, but because of the experience that they built around it. Now, I work in healthcare, and a couple of years ago, we started comparing our own consumer experience to the consumer experience of other companies, and we realized we had a long ways to go. A former colleague of mine asked, what if healthcare companies ran coffee shops? And it was a really interesting exercise, so I'd like to share that with you. So this is uh, the coffee experience, but a healthcare version of it. First. In the majority of our locations, we would require an appointment booked weeks in advance. When you got to the store, there would still be a line that you had to wait in for an unknown amount of time. If you looked at the menu, you'd probably get a general idea for the types of coffee on the menu, but there would be no prices listed. And if you inquired about pricing, you'd actually be told that there's no way to know that right now, and you wouldn't find out the pricing until later. Actually each barista would probably have slightly different prices from barista to barista, come to think of it, and their drinks would probably vary as well. Orders would be faxed from person to person behind the counter, which would increase the chance of a delay or a problem with your order. Now, after leaving the coffee shop, we'd probably get uh, referred to another location where we need to pick up that special sugar for our order. Six weeks later, we'd get a bill in the mail for $27,000, <laughs> but, and thank goodness for this, the final responsibility after insurance, only 8,000. Okay, so admittedly, comparing the healthcare system to the retail coffee experience isn't entirely fair. There's obviously a ton of factors within healthcare that make it a very complex business to be in, um, but this is the consumer environment that we find ourselves in in healthcare. And while we're making great progress, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, uh, there's still a ton of opportunity, which for me actually makes healthcare a really exciting space to be working in. So this afternoon, I'm going to show you how Providence St. Joseph Health is centering its thinking around the consumer and the consumer experience. Then we're going to dive into the weeds a little bit and talk about the first few simple use cases that we're working on that represent the first steps in bringing an elevated consumer experience to life. And then finally, I'm going to talk about what it's taken in terms of person power to bring this all together. So Providence St. Joseph Health is one of these health cares that's trying to simplify the healthcare experience and also provide a more consistent and personalized interaction uh, with our consumers. It's not an easy feat. We're one of the largest healthcare companies in the United States. We have 50 hospitals, 100,000 caregivers or employees, and um, we have uh, numerous lines of business within the healthcare space. Our facilities and staff cover seven western states, and we operate under a variety of different brands. We're a, a Catholic healthcare organization, but we've developed a model where we brought uh, secular brands into the fold as well. Now, one of the things that you hear pretty frequently around our company is a reference to what we call our promise. And long before we started on this consumer journey, you'd hear people reference this as they uh, talked about the consumer in their departments. So this statement, know me, care for me, ease my way, is the voice of the consumer. And it centers us on the meaning, uh, or on meeting their needs and hearing their voice. If fulfilled, it would mean that we've removed complexity and efficiency, discomfort, lack of respect, and lack of control 
from the entire patient journey. Now, healthcare today is this complex ecosystem of largely siloed functions. You have clinical services, insurance, healthcare business intelligence, marketing, strategy and innovation, and regional brands. And these have all historically operated pretty independently from each other. In this model, each business unit is basically having its own view of the consumer. And as a result, people experience something very different as they move through that system. We obviously want to change this to put the consumer at the center of this ecosystem and to have every function of the business delivering a consistent experience. So the key to all of this is that we have to share a single view of the consumer. So with this objective in mind, a couple of years ago, we partnered with IBM on a deep dive project that showed us what it would mean to put the consumer at the center. It was a huge effort. Um, it included internal research, multiple interviews with many of our caregivers, um, patients, and even our competitors. We ended up creating a consumer profile for someone named Lily. We gave her a backstory. We filled in details about her life and her family, and we gave her specific and realistic needs across multiple touch points of our company. For example, she starts by moving into our coverage area and needing to select a doctor, and she responds to one of our targeted marketing campaigns. So with this consumer journey, we thought through what would be required from a business intelligence perspective to enable a consistent experience for Lily. And we also took a stab at what technology would be needed in order for us to deliver on that experience that we wanted her to have. Through our work in bringing Lily to life, we really started to feel like we were getting to know her. In meetings, we weren't just talking about our promise anymore, but we were actually starting to relate what we were working on to Lily and her needs. So we've now done this with practically Lily's entire family, just so you know. Michael, Sam, uh, Simon, Joanna, and Jenny. Uh, every one of these consumer journeys takes a holistic approach and addresses not only the need of that consumer, but the needs of the family and the digital requirements to meet those needs. This work has been transformational for us as an organization. But what's been really exciting for me is to be able to start to work on the technology that brings this to life. So up next, I'm going to be work, uh, walking you through a couple of the use cases that we're starting with and that we've been working on over the last few months. So you can see how our technology stack is coming together uh, to deliver on our promise to Lily and others. And the starting point is in bringing all of our offline and online data into a common platform. So historically, our data has been completely and intentionally siloed, for example. When we ran marketing campaigns, we had no way of knowing what was effective beyond landing page visits. And when a consumer landed on the site and ended up calling into one of our call centers, we had no idea that the phone call took place, let alone if the person actually ended up later taking some action or becoming our patient. Now, of course, we could ask the call center to survey patients and ask them questions about what marketing was effective for them or what they liked, but you really can't optimize your creative or your digital ad spend or create a digital personalized experience based on this kind of self-reported data. Having data siloed, though, does reduce risk. And especially in a healthcare environment, this is an easy choice to make, as long as we're OK with staying in this old paradigm that's not consumer-centric. So of course, that's what we decided to do. Thank you very much. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> All right, so we obviously didn't do that. Um, this old paradigm obviously comes at a cost to the business. A less personalized experience for the consumer, higher advertising costs, there's digital waste and duplication, and lower business productivity as well. And I would argue that even increased risk to the patient's health itself. And I will talk about that a little bit later, so please remember that. The bottom line is that we can't keep doing this. Um, so to bring about change, my team is working with technologies that can join together our offline and online data. And what we want to do is enable personalization, deeper segmentation, and some more efficient targeting. Now, as you might imagine, as a $22 billion company, we have millions of dollars in digital ad spend and market every year. Our call centers are taking around 150,000 calls a month, and they're handling a wide variety of things, like marketing-related inquiries, as well as tasks and escalations from consumers. At a high level, our call centers are optimizing for time efficiency, or productivity, 
and they also want to provide a consistent experience for everybody that calls. But on a micro level, they also want the consumer to have a personalized experience. So this has us looking at any and all ways that we can help them to deliver that. And one way that we can do that is by helping them more quickly get to um, why somebody is calling so that they can provide that more personalized experience. So one of the first ways we're doing this is by building a process that links together anonymous data in Telium with our CRM. And one of the first use cases is to provide a screen pop in real time with relevant information to our call center staff for all incoming calls. So what this means is that for any phone calls that originate through a digital channel, we can display right on the agent's desktop things like the last known web URL for the caller and any digital campaign parameters right as the call is, co is connected. So why is this valuable? Well, our staff in the call center will tell you that providing this information provides context for that incoming call and it helps them to provide a more personalized experience for people. From a technology perspective though, even though it's a simple use case, it enables this whole host of other use cases that are really cool in the healthcare context. So here's an example of how this works. One common thing that consumers do after moving into our service area is they'll research physicians and then they'll call into the call center to get established with a physician that they choose or maybe just ask questions. If the liaison on the phone can see at the moment the call is connected, that a person is calling with the campaign parameter that says new mover campaign, a campaign source that says Facebook, and they know that that person was just looking at Dr. Moore's profile, they can get to both the what and the why of that call much more quickly. By the way, I just wanna mention this Benjamin W. Tester guy seems to show up in all of our data. He's got a whole host of health problems, so actually the whole Tester family is that way. Okay. So let's get into the weeds here just for a couple of minutes and talk about how this is working. So after moving into the area and enrolling in her uh, husband's insurance plan through work, Lily sees a display ad for Providence and she remembers that she needs to select a physician. So she clicks on the ad and lands on the Providence landing page. It's targeted for new movers and for their common needs. When Lily lands on the Providence site, Telium is assigning an ID as it always does and it starts storing incoming uh, data like campaign parameters and the landing page URL. And it's storing this all against Lily's anonymous profile in Telium. Now keep in mind at this point, we still don't know who Lily is from a digital perspective. So as Lily is anonymously browsing various pages or doctor profiles, the telephone number that she's seeing on screen are being dynamically rewritten to unique phone numbers that are associated with only her current web session. No other web visitor is seeing these specific phone numbers. We happen to be using a call provider called Dialog, uh, Dialog Tech for this, but there are others out there that you can check out. So when Lily does decide to make a phone call, either by clicking on the number while on her mobile phone or even just dialing the number off the screen, it doesn't matter, our call tracking partner knows the unique phone number that is associated to just her web session as well as the Telium ID. So as the call is being connected, our DNI provider is pinging Telium through a custom connector that we've built using Telium's webhook. It lets Telium know which web session is initiating the call and also provides Lily's caller ID. So Telium can now ping CRM in real time while Lily's call is being connected to an agent. It's forwarding to the CRM Lily's caller ID, her Telium ID, as well as those last known campaign URLs and, and uh, and parameters that we saw on the other screen. So when Lily and the agent are connected, the uh, CRM can match Lily's caller ID received via Telium with the caller ID that it's receiving via the telephony system and it can make a match. So this is where the screen pop happens. So the screen pop can happen with information received by Telium right onto the screen of the call center staff. Lily, of course, interacts with the agent. Maybe she selects a healthcare provider. Uh, and the agent maybe takes down her name and email address and phone number. At this point, the CRM will assign a permanent CRM ID to Lily, and at the end of the call, the agent will put the call outcome as a provider referral. So the last step here is that CRM will ping Telium back, and it'll provide the Telium ID, Lily's new CRM ID, as well as the outcome of the call. Okay, this is a really big deal because now within Telium, I got the reference to an ID of a real person, 
And I can use that for things like deduplication of my analytics, for measurement of the outcome of an offline interaction, or for enablement of segmentation or targeting. Now, I just talked you through one example of the ways that we're starting to join together profiles across systems, but we're thinking about other ones as well. For example, survey responses or email newsletters, when we send out those emails, we'll make sure that uh, in the backlinks coming back to our system, that we have identifiers embedded in those backlinks. Or form fills, of course. If we have um, people filling out forms online, we'll make sure that IDs are passed in hidden form fields. We're also thinking about a case around a dynamically targeted DNI, where if Telium doesn't know who a user is, we may selectively turn call tracking on so that if the consumer does make a call, we can stitch together their IDs. So I really actually like thinking about all of the possible ways that we could stitch together um, profiles across systems, but we don't really have time to go into all of those this afternoon. Um, the key takeaway um, from this whole process, though, is that through this one use case, we've transformed Lily from an anonymous um, user or an anonymous visitor to our website in Telium into a known user, and it enables some really interesting stuff. And don't forget that we've also delivered a more personal experience for Lily in the process and a more efficient call for our call center staff. So joining together these profiles also enables another capability, complex segmentation. Until very recently, any time we wanted to do any kind of exploration of data that was housed in our electronic medical record system, or our EMR, or if we wanted to build a segment for marketing purposes or anything like that, we basically needed to engage this specialized team called healthcare intelligence. This meant getting an analyst assigned and a project prioritized, and there was typically a lot of back and forth. Often it took a couple of weeks to turn around a, or even a basic request, and even uh, more, complex took, uh, more complex requests took even longer than that. What we typically got back was just a list of email addresses or direct mail uh, mailing addresses. And while these one-off campaigns can be very powerful and effective, it's super limited when it comes to things like programmatic ad targeting or personalization or any of these kinds of things that we really want to be able to do. So when CRM came online earlier this year and we integrated our CRM and EMR systems, this process was sped up significantly because we now have a limited number of common consumer data, cross, uh, data points across both systems. So not only our call center staff has ready access to that, but also we have analysts on the marketing side that have access to it as well. So having this data joined with CRM enables rich segmentation based on a combination of CRM activities and outcomes that are happening through our call centers, as well as EMR activities and outcomes that are coming uh, from the clinical side of the business. So things like consumer demographics and appointment statuses, affiliated physicians, call outcomes, and other data points. We're in this process right now of integrating Telium into the picture as well. So by having these three data sets synchronized with each other, we start to extend the power of segmentation beyond just the CRM data or just the EMR data or just Telium data. It really starts to give us the capability of building segments based on a combination of all of these through. And you start to get to the point where you've got this single view of the customer that we're working towards. So here's how this is going to work. Do you remember this abomination of a slide? We basically proved um, how we were leveraging a Telium connector to pass information from Telium to CRM and then from uh, CRM back to Telium to stitch together those, those um, data sets. And for known users, of course, we now have uh, a customer record across both Telium and CRM that we can associate future web data or even EMR activities and use those to build a segment. So anytime a user is coming back to the site, we've got additional activity that can be joined essentially with their contact record, and this can live alongside their CRM and EMR data. For example, we could build a segment of people who responded to programmatic ads with the display type of a honey bear or the creative type of a honey bear. They read three physician profiles, they called the, center, the call center to try to schedule an appointment, but then they didn't show up to the appointment. We could also build a segment of people who complained of joint pain to their physician. Maybe they were recommended one of our joint replacement seminars. They researched joint pain online on our sites and even requested more information, but then ultimately they abandoned the registration funnel. 
it seems like it would be a, in good interest to the, uh, to the patient and to us to re-engage with that, with that person. The point is, is that we're not just building static segments here that allow for one-time messaging. This process can be, can be used for dynamic marketing lists built off of multiple data points. We can leverage triggers to consistently adjust to the needs of the consumer and create a relevant personalized experience based on whatever their needs are. So because these profiles are linked by common IDs across multiple components of the stack, these segment lists that we build can even be pushed to Telium and shared anonymously with third parties. From Telium's perspective, these segments are simply lists of Telium IDs with no personally identifiable information attached to them. So anything that we want to do with a third party through Telium does not expose any PII. Now, as I mentioned, the key to all of this is getting these online to offline consumer transition points architected in such a way that the identifiers can be exchanged between these systems. So now that we've talked about joining together Telium, CRM, and EMR profiles, and we've talked about how we can use this kind of holy data matrimony to create a more complex segment, I want to talk through our thought process about using this capability in Telium and the third-party marketplace through targeting. So one thing that we deal with in healthcare when it comes to scheduling appointments is last-minute cancellations. And as you might imagine, uh, it's pretty expensive running clinics, and doctors are pretty expensive resources to have on the clock. When a consumer doesn't show up for an appointment, uh, we call it a no-show, and it's an expensive event for us. Unlike airlines, we don't intentionally overbook. So to lower that no-show rate, uh, we basically want to do anything and everything in our control to make sure that somebody like Lily remembers that she's got an appointment and that she shows up, or that if she can't make the appointment, that she just calls and, and reschedules. Now, our company is already engaged in a variety of ways to try to get people to remember their appointments. For example, we may send postcards or we may do robocalls. As a technical marketer, though, I would really love to join this effort. And I think if we keep our uh, brand messaging or our messaging in front of consumers in the days leading up to their appointment, that they'll be less likely to forget their appointment. And if they need to reschedule, if we're communicating in front of them, that they'll be more likely to reschedule if our brand is top of mind. Now, of course, we can use direct messaging channels like email or SMS. Um, these are uh, available through our marketing automation solution. But I want to focus on something else that we could do too. So using one of these enriched contact records that has a matched CRM and Telium ID, we could build a dynamic segment that moves consumers in and out of the segment based on their appointment status. So when Lily schedules an appointment, her Telium ID basically would qualify for this segment and she would be eligible for targeting. In this case, if she's added to that segment, uh, her Telium ID is pushed up to Telium through the CRM connector. Now, once that segment is in Telium, we can leverage any one of Telium's DSPs or partners to advertise to her in the marketplace. Now, keep in mind that neither Telium nor any of these external partners know anything about Lily beyond the fact that her Telium ID is qualifying for a particular segment. And none of those partners nor Telium are seeing any of Lily's personally identifiable information from anywhere else in our stack. So keeping our brand even generally engaged with Lily through multiple channels when she has an upcoming appointment is just another way that we can stay top of mind for her. And when she completes her appointment, her Telium ID can be removed from that dynamic segment, and uh, this would use the exact same process. And she'll probably be moved into another segment or campaign that's right for her at that time. So in the case that, her, uh, that she doesn't actually show up for her appointment, um, and the date passes, we can have her basically fall into another uh, messaging campaign or segment or a programmatic journey that seeks to re-engage with no-show appointments. Now, admittedly, this is not that different to what other industries are already doing, like travel, retail, finance, B2B. This is, this is some basic stuff here. But for us, this is a really huge deal. And I hope that you're starting to see how we're starting to uh, piece the data together and think about this. Uh, here are a couple of other just short examples of things that we're working through right now. So one is on sensitivity. So if somebody is on a pregnancy journey with us, for example, and the pregnancy is lost, are there ways that we can adjust our messaging uh, to that person to be sensitive to, to the needs that happen? Or even improper ER use. So uh, if somebody visits the emergency room 
and we see in their EMR data that only common treatments are administered and there's no hospital admission, can we make sure that they're included or that we're personalizing the site to educate them about more appropriate venues of care such as our retail clinics or urgent care centers? And then out migration, this is one where um, network affiliated physicians may refer to out of network physicians and this is, a, this is an issue for us. So we're thinking about ways that we could even in, uh, target our internal, uh, our internal people. And then uh, this is one of my favorites, I'll call it extreme personalization. So this is, uh, for example, when a certain someone, maybe they read the New York Times, but they have trouble remembering to take their pills. Uh, we could leverage a programmatic ad campaign and remind her, them, I mean, uh, to take their pills. I'm totally kidding. We're not going to be doing this. <laughs> but you all know it's technically possible, right? <laughs> okay, all right. I'm sure I've sufficiently freaked some of you out. <laughs> so this stuff doesn't happen automatically, um, and it's really not easy to do. In all sincerity, it's very cool to say that we're a $22 billion company, but actually we have a relatively small team working on this stuff. And there's no complaints there. It's just that it's really important to recognize that my team couldn't do this work by ourselves. We're, we're in a continuous partnership. And to be honest, it's at some points a negotiation with colleagues from uh, across our company like information system, innovation, marketing, engineering, our call center, our EMR team, executive team, and others. We absolutely could not do this work in a silo. The same is true with our external partners like Telium. We owe a lot of our execution success to our partners at Telium. And that's whether it's through our weekly engineering call or our account management help, platform configuration or strategic guidance. Um, it, really, uh, it really makes all the difference to work with vendors who understand what it means to be a partner when you're trying to take on something like this. And Telium has been by our side all along the way. So, okay. Earlier, I referenced how I believe that marketing technology can lower clinical risk for our patients. And I'll go further, actually, to say that I think that marketing technology can even influence clinical outcomes like mortality. Now, maybe this sounds like a big claim to make, um, but I honestly do believe that it's true. And it's what's most exciting for me about working in the healthcare space. So I'm, I'm going to be very curious what you think about this. So when I worked for content businesses, we were selling ad inventory on a CPM basis. It was all about increasing content consumption and engagement to drive our revenue. And what we saw was even small increases um, to engagement netted great returns at scale. Um, when I worked in retail, we worked on doing things like improving the conversion rate through the checkout process or figuring out how to grow average order value, for example. And even small improvements netted great returns at scale. In healthcare, we know that vulnerable populations are at a higher risk of mortality after contracting the flu. We already know that if they get their flu shot, the risk of mortality is lower. And I know, as a marketer, if we reach them with the right message at the right time, that they're more likely to get a flu shot. So what do you suppose this means? Here's the deal. Healthcare companies already engage in a manual process where clinicians and staff will reach out to people to remind them via phone or email to get their flu shot, or we'll stick sandwich boards outside our retail locations. We already know that when we successfully reach people and we get flu shots, we reduce uh, or we, we improve our outcomes. So what if um, through marketing technology we just started doing the exact same thing? If when somebody is in a high risk pool, if we make sure that they and people that look like them are targeted in our flu shot messaging and campaign that reminds them to get their flu shot, I believe that if a marketer reaches them with this message at, at the right time, that even small changes in our flu shot conversion rate will result in a higher percentage of that vulnerable population getting their flu shot at scale. If we can move that needle, even a fraction of a percent at scale, then we aren't just increasing brand engagement anymore, we aren't just driving revenue, we aren't reducing business risk and lowering the cost of care, we are doing all those things but we're also using marketing technology to influence clinical outcomes. In healthcare, marketers can influence clinical outcomes. And it doesn't take much of a stretch to see how we can do that. This is just one example, and we really are just getting started here. We have a bright future in the marketing technology space generally, 
But this is especially true within the healthcare space. For us at Providence St. Joseph Health, it started by unifying around a common vision of our consumer, identifying the first couple marketing use cases that we wanted to try to solve for, and then selecting the right technology partners. Maybe what we're doing isn't as flashy as what they do over there at Starlux, but I think that the work we're doing really will have an impact on lives, and I think the world. Thank you, it's truly an amazing time to be here.